Here we are, last section for muscle-driven simulations. We've talked about why to simulate movement, what is a muscle-driven simulation, details about how to test a muscle-driven simulation, and now I want to give you a quick introduction to OpenSim. It's a powerful tool for creating muscle-driven simulations. We created this to overcome many of the problems I talked about in the testing environment where people couldn't reproduce each other's work. OpenSim is freely available, it's um, very widely used and lets us reproduce each other's work and exchange models. You can use it in various exercises that go along with this class. I encourage you to do that. So what is OpenSim? One of the things it is, it's a musculoskeletal simulator. So what do I mean by that? There are methods that represent the nervous system, neuromuscular controllers. There are biological joints. Now, we aren't built with hinge joints and ball and socket joints. Your shoulder's really complicated. Your knee is complicated as well. So there's methods in OpenSim that let you simulate those biological complex joints. There are individualized models. You can scale a model to represent the size and shape of any individual, and that's key because we frequently develop subject-specific simulations. There are ways to compute the properties of muscle tendon dynamics, the energetic cost of locomotion. You can put ligaments into the model, calculate joint contact, and add various assistive devices. So you can see you can generate quite complex and comprehensive simulations. You can do that all in code, or you can use OpenSim as an application. So this is just what it looks like when you open it up. There's menus you can click, load models, analyze models. So to get started, it's pretty easy to use. And then it takes you all the way to very sophisticated tools. One thing that's valuable, it's a repository of models. So there's an OpenSim community that has contributed models uh, for example, landing on an inclined plane and your risk of spraining your ankle or tearing the ligaments in your ankle when you do that. There's simulations done of crouch gait, for example, a really nice detailed model of the shoulder and models of various animals, including ostriches, tyrannosaurs, chickens, frogs, mice. So there's this whole library of models that if you're interested in a particular problem, a particular question, you may be able to go to that library on simtk.org, grab the model, and immediately get started working with it. That's possible because OpenSim is a worldwide community. So here's just a map of people who are using the OpenSim documentation. The users come from a variety of disciplines, biomedical engineering, biological cybernetics, orthopedics, rehab, robotics, computer science. So it's a wide variety of individuals who are not only using the software, but also contributing algorithms, contributing models, and, and supporting each other in advancing human movement research. There's a growing number of individuals. You can see that's uh, continuing to increase over time. One of the things you can do is you can simulate impairments in surgery. So for example, this first um, simulation was done by Carmichael Ong, where the gastrocnemius, remember the big muscle in the back of the calf, has shortened muscle fibers. It's called muscle contracture. It happens in cerebral palsy, for example, and other conditions. And you can see because of that, there's walking up on the toes. We can then go into the model and we can lengthen that muscle. We can simulate a surgery that might correct that. And you can see what the, sur what the gait would be like after surgery. Now, I mentioned before that we can't really simulate the nervous system perfectly, especially in an individual who's had a stroke or cerebral palsy. So we're cheating here a little bit in the post-surgery analysis. We're assuming the nervous system is perfectly well controlled. And given that musculoskeletal system, this is the, the gait dynamics that we would observe. So there's a simulation playground. Sometimes we hypothesize that we walk in a way that minimizes the cost of transport, or we minimize the cost of transport without getting hurt, or improve head stability. Well, you can go in, and if you just minimize the cost of transport, you get something that looks kind of like walking, but it's not really matching up to human walking very well. 
we do more than minimize the cost of walking. We also don't want to hyperextend our joints or get injury. And when you include that, you get something that looks more biologically realistic. You see the head bobbing around a little bit more than usual. Eye gaze and maintaining stable eye gaze is super important for most mammals, including bipedal humans. So if you add to the optimization criteria, maintaining head stability and minimizing cost of transport and avoiding injury, you get a really beautiful looking uh, biological gait. So it gives the open sim gives you this simulation playground. You can also design assistive devices. This was a really beautiful study. The simulation uh, part of this was led by Tom Yoshida, the co-author of the book, where he could simulate a exoskeleton designed to improve running performance. And here's experimental data that was done uh, after the simulations where Tom predicted what the best actuation for the exoskeleton would be. Fantastic group in Connor Walsh's lab at Harvard built those beautiful devices and simulated, um, actuated the exoskeleton according to Tom's simulation. And that's what's shown in red. They got the greatest savings in metabolic cost using the actuation control scheme that was predicted in the simulation. Remember I talked about simulating real world situations. Here's a great example of that. One of the big challenges of making simulations is finding the controls, how to coordinate and control all those muscles to produce graceful movement. One of the things that we've provided just very recently is OpenSim MoCo. It's an optimization technique called direct collocation where you have a model of the musculoskeletal system and you set goals. You may want to minimize effort, track experimental markers, minimize joint loading, and you may or may not have experimental data. And what MoCo does is it computes the excitation patterns of muscles that produce coordinated motion. This is a grand challenge in the field and MoCo is a, a new tool that we're making available. Now there are many users developing expertise and I encourage you to do the same. So we've covered muscle-driven simulation in quite a comprehensive way. You now know why we simulate movement, what a simulation is, how to test it, and I encourage you to jump in, use OpenSim, try some pre-baked simulations, and try and make it some simulations on your own. So that's chapter 10. We're now gonna move on to chapter 11, where we talk about muscle-driven walking and what insights we can gain into locomotion by looking that deep.